Javier Falla. Turn this on, so I'll take care of that. Or Bud, well, thank you, Bud. Appreciate that. Wait just a minute. Did I say Merry Christmas? Merry Christmas. Thank you. It's been kind of hectic trying to get some things done here at the last minute, and because of the weather and all sorts of reasons. And we'll, we'll take care of this. But it's just that one switch that needs to be flipped. That'll do it. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Did I say Merry Christmas? Huh? 
And I'm <coughs> grateful so many people were able to come this evening. The roads are getting worse and we're going to have to drive very safely. And some of us will have a few miles to drive yet on our way back home. Fred, it's good to see you and your beloved. And you have a ways to go. And uh, obviously I do as well. So with that said, I'm so glad you're here. What we're going to do um, regarding communion, it'll be with by intention. And everyone will be invited to come forward. And you'll form two lines from this side and this side. And you'll go off like this. And after you receive uh, the elements, then you'll go by and you'll pick up your candle. And you'll go around, without it being lit, and you'll go around uh, um, the... the the pews on the outside, okay? And, and back where um, Alan is, you'll cut across that way. We're not using the back part of the church. Then what'll happen is your candles then, we'll, we'll have someone, Fatty and uh, Brenda, will begin lighting the candles at each end, and that's the way we'll fill the, the, the sanctuary up with the light. So I wanted you to know that. We anticipate a wonderful evening. We're glad, glad, of course, that Nino is here. And his beloved will be going to uh, back to Korea for a few weeks, and we'll miss you and have a very safe flight. It's a joy um, that you get to go. We're very happy for you. And for all our guests here, we welcome you and uh, have a safe ride home and a merry, merry Christmas. With that said, are there any other announcements that anyone would like to share this evening? All right. Then... We will begin our worship with a call to worship, which is simply that, and a call to silence, and that will be followed by the lighting of our Advent Christ candle. Good evening. Good evening. Four candles have been lit on the Advent wreath, the candle of faith, the candle of peace, the candle of joy, and the candle of love. Faith, peace, joy, and love. Four things we all desire, still there remains one candle to be lit. Tonight we light the Christ candle, recognizing that faith, peace, joy, and love are all possible through Jesus Christ. We recognize that the coming of the Messiah means that the things we most desire are given to us freely and graciously by God. Lord, be born anew in us this night. Light, Light of, of the world, world shine, shine on, on us, us always. always. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we believe that Jesus came to deliver us from fear of you, a God we could not see, and to introduce us to you and your wonderful love, demonstrated in the marvelous grace and mercy of your salvation. For you have given to us a sure hope for the future, which we could never attain for ourselves. And you have withheld from us the judgment we deserved for our sins. The Christ candle reminds us of all this and our hearts are filled with joy as we worship you on this Christmas Eve. Amen. Amen. Thank you and if you would turn to hymn number 48 we begin our worship with the singing of
be seated. <coughs> Our first reading is from Luke, of course, the Gospel, beginning with chapter 1 and verses 46. And if you care to read along with me, I'll give you a moment. This is the Word of God. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and to his descendants forever and ever, as he said to our fathers. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Please remain seated. Our second carol is number 37, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. <laughs> census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went out to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them. 
number 24. said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and, uh, God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left and gone back to heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about them, about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And this, please, our final hymn, Number 53, What Child Is This? <laughs>
you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Psalm 90, verse 1. I'll tell you what happened, and it happened this morning. <coughs> My original Christmas Eve meditation was written on Tuesday, and I had gone over it several times, and um, as usual, I liked it very much. Um, and I read it, and I reread it, and then I read it again this morning. And literally what I did is I picked it up and threw it away. Not that it wasn't good. It was. Well, it was all right. But after reading our Advent devotion by Henry Nowen, the one that was for yesterday, I realized happily that my sermon was inadequate and it needed to be just dismissed. What I'm going to do this evening, not out of laziness, but rather out of uh, um, um, great respect for uh, uh, Henry Nowen, I'm going to close my thoughts with a rereading of his devotion for yesterday. It, it was splendid. It, it, it's just wonderful. But to do that, I want to give a little bit of um, a little bit of background, and, and and I presume everyone will understand that the background is to explain why we're here this evening. Okay, I would hope so. I'm sure there are other ways. I don't know how many, but to my knowledge, there are three ways that we encounter God. And as a Christian, I would say. As the way we encounter Jesus Christ as living, personal Lord and Savior. And, and, and that, that language is important. Living, personal Lord and Savior. How do, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you encounter that power? One is in private meditation. Private meditation. I might add, this is the way anybody goes about encountering the divine. Uh, but speaking as a Christian, we encounter Jesus Christ in private meditation, which when authentic is mystical union with Christ. I use the word authentic, um, and I'm not going to digress, but, but you have heard me say this many times. M on most, m most of who we think Jesus really is, is in fact not who Jesus is, and so what we worship is an idol. I, I'm, I'm not only utterly convinced about that, I'm absolutely positive about that. So, so in one, one can encounter the real authentic Jesus Christ through what is called <clears throat> mystical union. Personal epiphany, if you will. Think, for example, of, of, of Mary who in her prayerful life, who I respect very much, the Virgin Mary, who Mary in her prayerful life uh, uh, is, is in such a, a state um, that she is able to encounter and, and to receive in her life um, the angel, when the angel comes to her. And the angel is a representative of God Almighty. The second way, or a second way, that we encounter the divine, and, and in this case, the way we encounter the personal uh, living Jesus Christ is through the study of Scripture. That's the second way people encounter the divine. It's enlightening and it's, in gui and it's guiding. And think, for example, of the people who have discovered God uh, and Jesus Christ by um, um, reacquainting themselves with the prophets by reading Scripture. That's the second way. That, that, we, that we meet God. And the third way that we meet God is in corporate worship. Now again, I, I have a, 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 a sentence that reads like this, corporate worship when, when authentic binds us in communion with each other as well as with the heavenly hosts. Now, I mean that literally. I don't mean that metaphorically. <coughs> When, when we are working together as a people of God, we're in communion with the, the saints who have gone before us in heaven, 
We're in communion with the angels. We're in, and I mean that. We're in communion uh, with Jesus Christ. We're in communion with God the Father. When our worship is authentic and, uh, and not contrived or whatever. So we, we, we meet God um, through mystical union. And that's in, in private prayer. That's the way I do it. Private prayer. Private devotion. Okay? We meet God and discover Jesus Christ as living and real through uh, an appreciation, an authentic appreciation of Scripture. And finally, uh, we, we encounter the living God, and by that I mean personal living Jesus Christ through corporate worship, which is worship um, with, with everyone and all powers that have to do with the power of love in, in Jesus Christ. Think, for example, of the shepherds who end up in this worshiping experience with the angels. Now, with that said, by the time of Jesus, the Jewish religious, uh, the Jewish religion, and I say this generally speaking, there were very many thoughtful, holy, devout, wonderful, God fearing, thoughtful Jews. But the Jewish religion as an institution, uh, by the time of Jesus, had become, again, so institutionalized that the primary, if not sole, purpose. Um, uh, and place, the, the sole purpose that, that the institution was, was to grant people of the only way that you could come to know to God. And so the sole reason then for the, 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 the Jewish religion was to make it that the, the only place that you could encounter God was in the temple. That's, that's where you encountered God. And the priests, being caretakers and interpreters of proper worship, judged that the reason Israel uh, was in bondage to Rome was due to improper or what they would call unholy worship. Hence, uh, great pains were taken to ensure holiness, purity. This meant, of course, that a large number of people um, were in trouble because large numbers of rules and regulations to ensure purity had to be observed. The result uh, was that probably most of the Jewish population, by religious necessity, was excluded from temple worship, which meant that they could not be reunited, or maybe even united for the first time, with the Lord. They couldn't find God. They couldn't encounter God. They couldn't discover the holy. They didn't have access to the proper prayer life. They certainly didn't ha have access to worship, and they certainly didn't have access to the proper understanding of scriptures. So they were um, disenfranchised uh, from, from temple worship. These people included lepers, sinners, outcasts, tax collectors, those who didn't pay their taxes, and then all the people with all sorts of sorted pasts. Now follow me on this. The theory is, and we practice it today in quote Christian churches, which I don't quite get why they're called Christian churches, but I'm serious about that. Um, sinners aren't permitted there because if a sinner comes into your church, what happens to your church? It becomes contaminated, doesn't it? And if it becomes contaminated, then you're not pure, and if you're not pure, who, who are you out of touch with? God. So you can't have sinners in your church. You can't have divorced people. Well, you know the whole list of all these bad people you can't have because, because they contaminate the worship experience. It, it goes on today in churches that are called Christian. I'm, I'm, tr I'm not sure that they know Jesus. That, well, I, I know that they don't know who Jesus is. I mean, I, that's not an issue. I know they don't know who they, they do not know who Jesus is. So it happened with the Jewish religion and the people who insisted on purity. You had this great number of people who were not permitted to be united or reunited with God. And so there was no way they could come to know salvation. You with me? Everybody there so far. 
Now, the crazy thing about this is the very place they're supposed to be is in the temple where they can receive instruction, where they can have worship, where they can be prayed for, where they can be healed, where they can be brought into purity, where they can be forgiven. But because they're impure, they can't go there. And so what's going to happen to them? They're doomed. See? I was going to say, does that sound familiar today? That's to me. So anyway, these people who had committed these hosts of uh, infractions were not permitted in the very place that God established to be for them to come to holiness, to come to salvation, to come to forgiveness, to come to reconciliation, to come to know who God is, to come to know what love is, to come to know what redemption means. They had no <coughs> possibility. So that's the situation. The unholy were excluded, and the unholy then were damned, because they weren't pure. Now the reason I mention this is that 2,000 years ago something happened. A child was born, and, and, the, and the, the, the the birth of that child shook the foundations of the religious establishment and it shook the foundations of the politics of purity. And it shook the foundations of the, the rabid fundamentalists who insisted on this way to purity. Now, I know what I'm talking about because I personally know Jesus Christ. And I personally know who he permits in his fellowship. I personally know Jesus Christ, and I personally know who he pals around with. I personally know that. And I'm going to say this one time, he pals around with sinners. Those are the people in his company. Now, I know people are going to say that's not true. I say to you, I'm saying this to the world, I'm not saying to anybody here, I'm preaching to the choir, I know I am. If you don't believe me, then all I can say, and I'm serious about this, you have never read the Bible. You have not read the Bible. And you have no idea who Jesus Christ is. And because of that, I'm preaching to the world. You're doomed. You are doomed. Jesus is born and the religious establishment begins to crumble because something is happening in the stable. A child is born and is named Jesus and his name means one who saves. It does not say one who saves the pure people. Yeah. Do you know that? It, it, it does not. I'm going to save you when you're pure. See, that's demonic. Indeed, the one in whom God chose to dwell is Jesus Christ. Indeed, the one in whom the mystic can find God is in Jesus Christ. Indeed, the one uh, whom one cares to read about in Scripture, you can discover Jesus Christ. Indeed, in this person, Jesus Christ, um, you can discover who God really is. The one in whom one can worship Jesus Christ, and, and in worshiping Jesus Christ, incidentally, not because the priest or the minister or the rabbi permits you to come into his church because you're finally pure, but rather because the minister like this one says, we want sinners in here because that's the only way they're going to become saved. There's a Mennonite church in Mean Blossom, have you seen that? And it's got a, a sign. Was it sinners welcome and strangers welcome? Let her put that on our door. Sinners welcome. I like that. Be that as it may be, then those who discover the sinners of us, Jesus Christ, then we discover forgiveness. And when we discover forgiveness, we discover joy. And when we discover joy, we discover God. So that's the background. Not very inspiring, I know. 
the truth, though. But here's something I fell in love with. I want to read this, Henry now. It begins this. It's called Jesus My Home. And again, Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. And the background there is the idea of the temple. And we go to the temple, and God dwells there in the temple as God dwelled in the tabernacle. And that's the dwelling presence of God. And there we discover God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Then Malin writes this. The place of our true belonging is not made by human hands. It is fashioned for us by God, who came to pitch his tent among us, invite us to his place, and prepare a room for us in his own house. Isn't that beautiful? Words for home are often used in the Old and New Testaments. The Psalms are filled with yearning to dwell in the house of God. It is highly significant that St. John describes Jesus as the Word of God dwelling among us, living among us. And in his farewell address, Jesus reveals himself as the new home. Jesus is the new home. Jesus says in 15.4, Abide in me, dwell in me, live in me, abide in me as I abide in you. By making his home in us, Jesus allows us to make our home in him. By entering into the intimacy of our innermost self, he offers us the opportunity to enter into his own intimacy with God. You want to know God? Know Jesus. You want to know Jesus? He's invited you into his home which is himself. By entering into the intimacy of our innermost self, he offers us the opportunity to enter into his own intimacy with God. By choosing us as his preferred dwelling place, he invites us to choose him as our preferred dwelling place. This is the ministry, this is the mystery of the incarnation. I'll read that again. By choosing us as his preferred dwelling place, he invites us to choose him as our preferred dwelling place. This is the mystery of the incarnation. Amen. If you'd be so kind, stay seated. I'd like for the attendant elders to come forward. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the one who extends this invitation to enjoy Holy Communion. All who take Christ as the Lord and Savior are more than welcome. Those who have children who uh, the parents believe are ready to assume and receive Jesus Christ in, in this, what is in fact an altar call, are welcome as well. And I would be remiss in not telling everybody that this is Grayson's first Christmas, and we're very happy. Please stay seated in the first two verses, O Little Town of Bethlehem, 44.
on first Christmas, which is the unification, reunification of mere mortals, um, sinners with God, is, is shared again every time we break the bread and drink the cup. It's a reminder that God loves us. It's a reminder that God has invited us into God's presence to be about communion with God and with Jesus and with the saints. I like that. On the night that Jesus Christ, lover of my soul, was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he had broken it, blessed it and he gave thanks. And in a similar way, did he take the wine, the very cup, and <coughs> the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Indeed. In a mystical way, it is the blood of God. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Lord, by your kindness, you have brought us to this table. It was you who called us on this bleak, winter time, evening, and the snow is coming down, and the wind is whipping up, and you called us, and we heard your call, and we've come to your dwelling place, that you might dwell in us, and that is good. And we have come here, imperfect, a little less than angels, we have come here merely mortal, and yet here we are, and we give thee thanks for that. Indeed, this is the feast of the people of God, and men and women and even little ones will come from the north and from the south, and in this fellowship they come from Korea, and they come from Taiwan, and they come from Pacific <coughs> Islands, and they come from the Middle <coughs> East, and they come from all over the world, and they come, as you've heard me say, even from Carolina and South Carolina, and they've come from Colombia, and they've come from Geddes Creek Road, which is a nice place too. They've come throughout the world because Jesus Christ called them to this table. We're thankful for that. On the night that Jesus Christ, lover of my soul, was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. And in a similar way, also the cup. Every time you drink of this, you do so in remembrance of me. Amen and amen. Please, one pew at a time and one row at a time, you'll come forward. And I ask the elders to come forward.
Jesus Christ. And what is your name? Bob, this is the body of Jesus Christ. Now, may this is the blood of Jesus Christ. Darren, my friend, this is the blood of Jesus Christ. Rachel, my friend, this is the blood of Jesus Christ. Bob, my friend, this is the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly God, this kindness that you have bestowed upon us, we rejoice and give thee thanks. Receive now our, our happy hearts as we sing now, indeed, with the angels on high, this most precious of songs. has been passed to you. Do not keep it under a barrel, but rather share it with the people who need it the most, the lonely, the downcast, the broken, the sinners, the most despicable and despised, those who need the salvation of Jesus Christ. Be an angel. Be an angel. And may the blessings of Jesus Christ now rest upon every single human being here now and forevermore. Amen. And go in peace. Mm -hmm.